Hello, hello, hello. How are you guys doing this evening? It is 1.47 a.m. And my goal, I just woke up. <laughs> I went to bed with Alex tonight. And my goal is to um, vlog this. I'm not even gonna say it's not gonna be that long because I have no idea how long it's gonna be. I keep on saying that it's between like 50 minutes and an hour long, so I'm not gonna say that. Um, but what time? What did I say? What time it is? Okay, so I can kind of remember in my head. What I am gonna say is that as soon as this vlog is over, I am gonna go home and I am going to. Well, Alex is asleep, so I have to sit on the front porch. But I'm gonna sit on the front porch and I'm gonna finish Orange Is the New Black. I have. I'm on episode 12. There's only 13 episodes, and. Um, I'm really ready to finish it. I'm so like into it. And um, last night I watched episode 11 and I bawled my eyes out. So yeah, I'm ready to get it done and finish it. So I did not do great on my diet today, but I did make it to my personal training appointment. And um, she was so happy that I was there. She was, she's awesome, I love her, but she, worked my butt off and um tonight when i woke up like a half an hour ago i was so i'm so sore right now from having not worked out in forever and um and she didn't even like we did like the same four exercises over and over but she had me like do like 20 reps of each one i did just like these uh bicep lifts and then um i did a lot of stretching today i think the stretching is actually what did it um because she had me do these lunges. Well, I guess, so I, I start off and I do like lunges and I do like, you know, like rolling my arms backwards and forwards and some other stuff. But then she had me do these bicep lifts and then she had me do this thing where I stepped up on this bench and hopped. And she had me do 20 on each leg and then I had to do it again. And I think, I, did I do it two times or three times? I don't know, but then she had me doing these rowing things on these ropes and I just, I am sore. I'm so out of shape. And <laughs> so anyway, um, Alex texted me like sometime in the middle of the afternoon and he was like, what are you doing? And I'm like, went to my training and then I made videos. I made videos on all of my channels today. I was so proud of myself because I was like, okay, I'm going to get, go to my training and then I have videos I want to make on each of my channels. I haven't made a booktube video in quite some time. So um, I made videos on all of my channels and got them up and he was like, I'm really hungry and I want to eat something bad. Oh, and he had just asked me last night, he was like, how can I be supportive? <laughs> and I said, well, I probably shouldn't go and eat anywhere and just stick to the Octavia. And he goes, okay. And then he was like, I'm really hungry for something bad. So I said, well, let's talk about it when you get home. Cause I was just wanting to like go somewhere and eat with him, you know, and just kind of like hang out and talk. And so I said, when he got home, I said, well, what are you hungry for? And he goes, pizza. And I said, okay. I said, do you want to get pizza and carry it? I thought we'd just watch it at home or eat it at home and watch TV or something. And he was like, uh, do you want to go to Puccini's or Puccini's is like one of our favorite restaurants. It's like a local pasta place and they have like this cheese pizza that he, he loves. Like this, he gets like a huge cheese pizza and then brings it home. <clears throat> and he was like, do you want to go to Puccini's or do you want to go to Pizza Hut? And I was like, oh, so you want to go somewhere and get pizza? And he was like, yeah, I'm really, I could tell he was craving Puccini's pizza. He dips it in like, they have like great marinara there and he dips it in the marinara, all their sauces and uh, like their fettuccine sauce or their Alfredo sauce and their spaghetti sauce. Everything is like homemade. Everything there is homemade, their bread and everything. It's fantastic. And it's super cheap, too. I mean, not super cheap, but it's not like... I mean, it's on the level of, like, Applebee's. It's pretty cheap. So, he was like, yeah, he was like, let's do that. That's what I want. I was like, okay, let's do that. And so, we went. And I usually get a house salad there, but I got a wedge salad with no bacon, which was really, really good. And then I got the fettuccine Alfredo, which I was kind of worried that my stomach was going to hurt because... They make a lot, and I talked about this on here the other day, and it, a lot of people had a lot of different diagnoses for me. Whenever I eat something that is like really creamy and it's made like um, in-house, like the, the salad dressing is made in-house or the pasta sauce is made in-house and it's like heavily creamy, you know what I'm talking about? It always upsets my stomach. 
Um, but I don't think that I'm lactose intolerant because I eat cheese and all kinds of other stuff. And what is that little place there? Oh, that's cute. Is that a restaurant? And it really never bothers me when I do that. But like, it's always with like the creamy stuff. I feel like Alex has talked about this place. Oh, it's empty. So did it close? It must have closed. Or is that, is it just right there? This little restaurant place. Well, I don't even, I don't think it's closed down for good. So anyway, um, there was a sign on the door that says an hour or so. I'm losing my mind. These water uh, or sprinklers are like on like all night long too. No, it looks like it's still open. Oh, that place is cute. Huh. I know we'll have to go there sometime. Um. So I was worried that my stomach would hurt, but my stomach didn't hurt at all. And we had fun. We sat there and talked and just caught up and had a little date night and it was real nice. And then we came home and, um, I had to call and talk to a couple sober people and uh, I've been waiting for a call all day. So talk to my friend and then, um, and he talked to Sarah on the phone and then we were going to watch TV together, but there was really nothing that I, that he had recorded that I wanted to watch too. So I was like, I'm going to lay down for an hour. And so I went up to lay down, but then he came up right afterwards and he was like, I think I'm just going to go to bed. So we went to bed early. It was so nice. Um, Boo Radley's hair is growing out <laughs> and it's driving him nuts, I think. Cause he like shakes his head like constantly and it wakes me up. So like just as I get to sleep, he like shakes his head real hard and he sleeps right next to me behind my back if I'm turned on my side, which I was. So, um, so he kept on waking me up. It was so hilarious. But anyway, so yeah, that was our night. I had a good day. I had a really, really good day. It was beautiful outside. It's 68 right now, but it was warm today. So, so much for my diet today. But I had a good dinner. I enjoyed my dinner. The wedge salad, I usually get the dinner salad, but I got the wedge salad tonight. I didn't even know they had a wedge salad there. And then there was this big table of women next to us and one of them got in a wet salad and I saw them bring it out and I was like, oh, I want to try that. It looks really good. So I tried uh, the wet salad and I loved it. <laughs> it was basically just blue tree cheese dressing with, uh, with lettuce though, because, um, I didn't have any bacon on it. And it, there really wasn't anything else. I don't think there was anything else on it. Sometimes when you go, like, I like when they have the little cherry tomatoes and they have them halved. I love that. When you go places and they do that. So anyway, yeah, that was my day. It was a good day. Good, good day. PB didn't really cough as much today. Um, he, I think he coughed once or twice. But not as much as he, you know, had been, which really worried me yesterday. He coughed a, was it yesterday that he coughed a lot or the day before? It was yesterday that he coughed a lot. <clears throat> it was interesting. I was watching Orange is the New Black last night and there's this part in it. I'm not, I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but there's a part in it. I talked about it actually in my Peterisms video today. I rewound it like a couple times because it really... I always get like messages from like pop culture, like songs or movies or whatever, you know, about things to think about or whatever. I'm gonna go get a Diet Coke or maybe even a Dr. Pepper tonight. Um, but there's a part where Piper, the main star, goes to this like event and the person that she's with is like the speaker at the thing and she's like, you know, talking about it. And I'm trying to be really like vague about it. So in case you're gonna watch it, it won't ruin it. She's not talking about anything that really has to do with the show, but she is kind of talking about the condition of, like, anyway. But she says in there something to the effect of, 
like when you stumble, you can't get, and I'm totally just like paraphrasing what she said, but basically when you stumble, you can't get stuck like in the stumble that you have to keep on putting one foot in front of the other and you have to um, keep on focusing on hope. And I was thinking about that, you know, like in my life and in my sobriety and at times that have been difficult in my life that I think it is about not getting stuck in the stumble, you know? that Those aren't the words that they use, but, or she uses, I can't remember what she says, but, um, I think sometimes it's wanting to relive that over and over and over again, and I think sometimes to sit in it and evaluate, you know, whatever you're going through, no matter what that is, but at the same time, I think it's important to to have hope, you know, like, I mean, I think back on, like, the early days of sobriety, you know, when I was going to, like, two, three meetings a day, and, you know, counseling twice a week, and, you know, my whole life was all about that, and I had no money, and the only food I was eating was what other people bought me, or what my dad was providing for me in the refrigerator, thankfully, I'm so grateful for that, you know, and that a cup of coffee late at night, sitting there, you know, reading a book, or doing my meditations, <laughs> sitting there, you know, I can remember, like, sitting, like, making a pot of coffee, and, you know, watching a movie after I came home from, like, uh, my early days of sobriety, I have to tell you, were... Like, once I got out of treatment, and I, and treatment wasn't bad, you know? Like, once I got out of detox, like, I felt very safe in treatment. And, um, I felt, I just felt incredible in treatment, you know? And, um, I started feeling healthy in a way that I had never felt before. And even though I was scared of when I got out, I mean, like, there was a good two weeks where I knew it was, two or three weeks where I knew it was, like, not going to be the next day. I remember when I found out that I was getting out and I talked to my counselor who is still a friend of mine today and I said to her, um, I'm scared to go. And she said, um, she said, but do you have everything prepared? Like, do you have a sponsor? I had a sponsor. She was like, you know, you've done this, you've done that, whatever. And I said, yeah. And she said, I think that, you know, being prepared, but also being afraid is exactly where you need to be. And she's like, you know, you're more, you're more ready for this than you think you are. And I remember her saying that. I think one of the other things that she, the most powerful thing she said to me, um, as I left, I don't know why this is getting me real emotional. I've been like really, really involved and I can't tell you guys about this stuff, but I've been really, really involved in recovery stuff lately. And um, I just, like, my heart is so, I mean, more so than I usually am, and, um, and I'm pretty active <laughs> as it is, and so I'm just kind of saturated with it right now, and it's so good, and it's just really making me grateful for each moment of my life, you know, and just, um, what I have today and how it was just built on the foundation of my sobriety, and, um, I remember my counselor, I was standing there, like, we'd had group, and I was getting ready, I, you know, she had signed off on me, so I was getting ready to get my stuff and, um, to leave. I remember she stood there, and she, like, put her hands on my, you know, shoulders, and she said, you're gonna be okay. And I think those are really powerful words when we say that to people. You know, whenever I say that, like, in a vlog or in a Peterisms video, you know, people are always like, thank you for saying that. Like, I needed to hear that. You're going to be okay. Like, you are going to be okay. This too shall pass, you know? There's going to be the better things that happen in your life. There's going to be worse things that happen in your life, but you're going to be okay, you know? And um, I remember she put her, her hands on my shoulders and she said, this will be the hardest thing you ever do. But if you do this, it's yours and nobody can take it away from you. And it will give you an amazing life. And she was absolutely right. And I didn't really understand the power of those words at that time. You know, I don't think when people say things to us, we're like, I mean, today I hear people say things and I'm like, wow, that was a pretty profound statement, right? But like, I don't really know the impact of their words until later. Um, 
And I think I've had I've been so blessed to have people say things to me. I'm trying to think of some other things that people said to me in early sobriety that really stood out for me, you know. Um, but that was a big one for me. I remember sitting in a lead early on too. And I was listening to this guy. And I don't even really remember his story. I don't remember his story. But I do remember it was at the treatment program that I had gone through. Because I had gone back to a meeting there. And I can see, and he was like younger. And he was like kind of like physically built. And he was like in good shape. And you know like his outer look and his life matched what I wanted. Like you know I wanted to have my stuff together. And be. Hold on. <coughs> <coughs> One more? No. Thank you. <laughs> For those of you out there that said bless you and gesundheit. tight. Um, you know, I wanted to be, like, have my stuff together. I wanted to be, like, a real human being with, like, that, you know, had a life. And, um, and he was closer to my age, which I think was more relatable. It was a Sunday morning meeting that I used to go. I used to go to this Sunday morning meeting. And they had, like, boxes of donuts in the back. And I can remember going to that meeting just for the donuts. Like, that is so crazy to me. And I look back on that. Like, I can go anywhere today and buy a donut. But back then, like, I never even had enough money to, like, go and buy a donut. So, like, that's crazy to me. You know, and I look back on that. And I used to go, and they had the best donuts on Sunday mornings. It was called the Sunday morning bre It was called the Sunday Breakfast Club meeting, I think, or something like that. So, and you could pay, like... Um, a dollar or two dollars to, um, or if you were part of one of their outpatient programs to eat breakfast in the cafeteria for that day. And I was in aftercare for my first year, so I would go there and eat breakfast on Sunday mornings. Okay, the meeting started at 9. I would get there at 7.30 and I would eat with people that I knew and then go to the meeting after. Can you imagine Peter Mon getting up early enough, showered, okay, hair done, presentable, because that was probably just like my first two or three months that I did that. That I went to that. Well, I mean, I went to that meeting consistently for a long time. But that I got up that early and went and had breakfast and stuff like that. That's crazy when I look back on that. That I was up that early on a Sunday. Well, when I came back, you know, when I had gone out, like, gone out and not gone to meetings. I didn't go out and start using again. But when I um, didn't go to meetings for four years and then I came back in, there was a Sunday meeting at 11 that I would go to and it was about 25 minutes from my house and it was a fantastic meeting and then it would be over at 12 and I would stand around and talk to people till about 1230 and then I would drive home and I would get Alex and we would go to brunch I think that might be how the brunch thing started actually I wonder I think that is how the, the brunch thing I always kind of wonder how our regular brunches started but um so yeah but I remember I was sitting in this meeting and this guy was giving his lead. And I remember thinking to myself, if I'm going to do this, like if I'm going to really stay sober, because I was really struggling with the fact that everybody else wanted me to stay sober, <laughs> which in reality, what it was, was that everybody was pretty checked out at that point. They really didn't care if I stayed sober or not. I mean, I think they did, you know I mean? I'm sure that they were like worried about my life and didn't want me to die. But at the same time, I don't think anybody had any faith, like my family and friends, I don't think they had any faith that I would stay sober, none whatsoever. And my counselor later told me, she said to me, she goes, you, it's always the ones you think it, it, that you don't think it's going to be. She goes, I had no clue, Peter, that you would be the one that down the road would stay sober. She goes, I had no clue. If I had to put money on somebody that I thought would stay sober, you were not the one. And, um, which I think is so funny in retrospect, you know, <clears throat> I don't know why me. I wasn't super serious in treatment. I wasn't even, I didn't even pay attention half the time. But something changed me in there, you know? It just, like, it profoundly changed me in there. Um, and I remember sitting there in this meeting, and this guy was talking, and I kind of made this deal with myself. I've talked about this on here before, and I was like, if I'm going to continue to do this for me... Like, if I'm going to go to meetings and really... And I don't even know that I really knew what do this meant. You know, but if I was going to really stay sober and work a program and get a sponsor that I would work with and all this kind of stuff, if I was really going to do that, then I was going to make something of my life. It wasn't just going to be to go to meetings for the rest of my life and, you know, to just have... And not that there's anything wrong with that. I have friends of mine that really, their lives have never changed and they just, you know, started going to meetings instead of this. But I was like... I'm not, like, this, 
I want something out of my life. I want this to be, you know, a foundation for something. Although I wouldn't have known to put those words to it at that time. But I wanted to have a life. I wanted to have an exciting life. I wanted to have relationships with people. And, you know, I wanted a boyfriend. And, you know, I... I don't know. I think I kind of, like, indirectly, like... <sighs> made some deal with my higher power, like, you know, and was like, okay, God, you want me to do this? Let me have a life in response to that. You know, let me have a boyfriend. Let me have, you know, people that care about me. Let me have a life that I care about, you know? Let me have exciting, fun things to do. And I got that, you know? I was like, I'm not gonna stay sober for the next 40 years and be just Hello. this boring person. Currently, we are closed for 30 minutes. Up here, system is down. Please, please try again in 30 minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Hunter. They literally just served that person in front of me. It's like they can see me coming or something. Ugh. Or maybe they didn't. Because he's taking off, too. I know he's pulling back around. Hmm. I don't know. But I don't think it matters what time I come through here, their computer system always seems down. I'll just go to the other McDonald's. Um, <clears throat> but you know, I was kind of like, if I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna live this life, and you know what's really, the, the interesting thing over it is, <clears throat> I looked back on it and thought I was like giving something up, you know? I really thought I was giving something up for this, I better get a great life out of this if I'm gonna give up all of this. What What was I giving up? You know, being wasted all the time and nobody depending on me and me being, you know, irresponsible and not a good son and, you know, on and on and on. <clears throat> that's what I was giving up. I think that's interesting when I look back on that, right? So, then, what do I get as a result? I get this unbelievable life and I get this unbelievable way to look at life and to do inventory and evaluation and I have you know a sponsor that unconditionally loves me and will challenge me enough when stuff is going on to say all of this stuff that is going on around you that you're struggling with are all opportunities for growth what is your part in this what can you do how can you be the best person that you can be how are you affecting other people we, what, with what you're doing and what you're saying in the world, how are you affecting the world around you? Do you want to be of service or do you want to affect people negatively? And that's my choice on a daily basis, you know? And, um, and today I choose to be of service. And I got this incredible, amazing life as a result of sticking around. So I'm grateful for it. Obviously. But I remember those early days, and to get back to what I was saying originally, you know, like, where am I at on time? Oh, it's going to stop here in about 25 seconds, but, or less than that probably. But I, um, you know, those early days, I can remember, I just was overwhelmed with, like, this schedule that was really, like, I mean, I wasn't even really living in the real world, let's just be for real, and, you know, everybody that I was interacting with, none of us were working, we were all just going to three meetings a day, and it was people of all ages, and, you know, a lot of people that I knew back then that were going to meetings were on disability and doing things like that until they could get themselves back on their feet again. It's gonna stop, hold on. You know, and... And that was the majority of the people that I knew that were in early sobriety, but I was told to, you know, stick with the winners, which were the people that had more clean time, that had, you know, a year or more clean time and had their lives together. And all those people had jobs, you know? And, and that was what I wanted. I was like, I want to get a job. I want to get back on my feet. I didn't even really know that I wanted to go back to school at that point because when I got right out of treatment, I was supposed to go back to school and I started and then I withdrew from my classes because I was like, I cannot do this right now. I need to focus on my sobriety. I really think and thank God that I had my father to help me because I really think that had I gone back to school right away, I don't think I would be here today. I, I really don't believe I would have been. Had I got out and, I, you know, I, it, I was able to focus that time and that attention on my recovery. And I think today that's why, you know, if you know somebody going through, we didn't have the halfway house 
world that we had back then. And I know that halfway houses are not the answer. And I know a lot of people use in halfway houses, but you know, I believe that you can stay sober in a lot of environments. And even though people are using in some halfway houses, there's a lot of people that aren't using that are serious about recovery too, you know? And if you have the chance to go into a halfway house, go and stay as long as you possibly can and be in an environment where you're around people every day that are going to meetings and working with sponsors and doing steps and talking about recovery and stuff like that. There, there's some, like in our town, there are some fantastic, fantastic halfway houses in Indianapolis, you know? I have this carry out drink from <laughs> Puccini's, which I was calling Pooches tonight. And Alex was like, why do you keep on calling that place? I'm calling Puccini's Pooches. And I was like, I just think it's funny. But anyway. But at that time, you know, I would go to two to three meetings a day. And, you know, I had... I mean, my dad would go to the grocery store. My dad was so fantastic during all of that. And you have to remember, my mother at the same time was probably in the worst six months of her addiction that she ever had. She was isolating. She was in the condo she had just moved into. She was lonely. She wasn't talking to anybody. She really wouldn't talk to me. And when I did talk to her, if she had been drinking, I'd say, I'm not talking to you. And I would say, I can't be, because I, oh, that was the other thing that my uh, my uh, counselor made me do. She made me call people and tell them that I couldn't see them if they were using. And my mother was one of those people. And that was a really powerful thing I had to do. And my mother was like, you know, you can't mean me. I was like, mom, I, I'm told that I can't be around people that are using. Well, you can't really mean me, Shirley. <laughs> and don't call me Shirley. I was like, yeah, mom. I mean, she was one of the people that triggered me the most. She was so offended by that and then later totally understood it, which was crazy how that turned around, you know. But, like, her drinking just excelled and excelled and excelled. It got so bad towards that last six months. I did not see my mom. You know, I was so just, like, in deep with 12-step program and uh, going to meetings and talking to my sponsor. Who, my first sponsor at that time, I didn't, like, he was okay, but... He was just okay. That's all I'll say. Um, my second sponsor was really who I really consider my first real sponsor. Poor man succumbed to this disease, died of a heroin overdose, in a really in a really tragic way too. It wasn't. I mean, any way that happens is tragic, but anyway. Um, I mean, you think about that too, like, I remember getting the call. He wasn't my sponsor when he passed. Um, so what happened was, I actually have all of my change um, counted out. You guys, I can't make this shit up if I try. Are you ready for this? Hi, my husband. It says no Diet Coke. Do you still have no Diet Coke? Yeah, I have no Diet Coke. Okay, can I get a large uh, Dr. Pepper, please? Yeah, what else? That's it. One on ice, it's on Have a good evening. Is 
Is there a trash can right here? Please tell me there is. If there is, hold on a second. So, I think I've told this story on here before. Oh, it's cutting into my, so, um, into my stomach. It's nice, isn't it? So what happened was, it was my, I think it was my two year sobriety date. I like I think I used to say four year but it wouldn't have been my four year because I was going to my home group with Tanya by then and my others and that's the sponsor that I had that I had for a really long time so it it, it would have been my two year it had to have been my two year um right I think it was my two year I think I used to say four year but I think it was my two year so it's like my two year sobriety birthday. And my home group was actually a different 12 step program at the time that he and I went to. And it was in a, um, it was in a drug treatment facility that does, it no longer exists, but it was here in Indianapolis. And it had a, like a psych program and stuff. It was in a charter hospital. Do you guys know charter hospitals? I used to be around, I don't, it's not here anymore. I don't even know if they exist at all. So, like every week that I went, like he wasn't answering my calls and he and his wife had split up by that point. His wife was a friend of mine. And, um, anyway, he just stopped coming. And then every week, it was like less and less people. Until I went in on my birthday week, and he was like, yeah, I'm gonna bring you a cake, and we'll show up, and all this kind of stuff. I'm gonna have to look at my coin at home, because I can I know which coin it is. It's this green and gold coin that he bought me specifically. And I have it with all of my coins. And it will, whatever year it is, is what year it was. I don't know why I can't remember that, but. So he was like, yeah, I'll meet you, and I'll bring you a coin, and stuff like that. Well, he had been using it, and I didn't know that. Um, I found that out later. And so, um, he didn't show up like the week before and he didn't show up the week of my birthday. And I was literally the only person. Well, when you walked in, they would give you like the binder for the meeting and stuff. Now, I mean, mind you, I was early in sobriety. I didn't know how you closed down a meeting. I didn't know if I, I had, I didn't start the meeting. I wasn't like a secretary of the meeting. I wasn't the chair of the meeting. I wasn't anything at this meeting except for just somebody showing up. But since I was the only one, they were handing me the binder, right? And so, this woman and her, this it, it's just, it, you guys, there were so many tragic stories that came out of this meeting. Literally one by one every week. Okay, my battery died. And then I uh, <laughs> couldn't get the battery out of the camera. God, it's so hot. I wonder if that's why it dies sometimes. If it's not that it's not charged, but that it just gets really, really hot. I wonder if that's why. But anyway, um, I was talking about this meeting that I went to and that like week by week, it was like, you know, if there were, so they would bring like people like, you know, in from the hospital that were there at the hospital, um, like a staff member would. So, but then they stopped doing that. And so if there were like 10 or 12 of us total at this meeting, it was a small meeting at this meeting, you know, then one week it would be like 11 and then it would be like nine. And that was like little by little until it was really just down to me and my sponsor. And then just me for like two or three weeks, two weeks, three weeks, I don't know. I think it was two weeks, it was just me. And so I had a binder with how all the stuff started and I mean, when I tell you that like each one of these people went out and um, it was not good. And I think it's weird like like, I think in a weird way, like, it scared the hell out of me because I realized, like, 
I think to some degree what happens is you get sober and you like just kind of surround yourself with like only, well I did at least, I surrounded myself with only people that were in sobriety. Like my first couple years, I didn't hang out with anybody that wasn't in sobriety. None, you know? I dated like a guy that wasn't in sobriety and I had a roommate and she had been my roommate long before and she was super supportive of me like when I got sober. Super, super supportive of me. And that was it, you know? Um, but I didn't like, <laughs> the, like 80 to 90% of my friends were all people that were sober and in recovery, right? So you live in this kind of isolated world. Well, when people start going back out and they go back out and I think they're people that you're close with, people that I was seeing on a regular basis and talking to and hanging out with, I had a lot of friends in my early sobriety that went back out. I mean, a lot of them, I don't even know what happened to them, you know? And so when you see that happen, not just the people that I went through, treat, through treatment with, but people that I was friends with my first year or two, um, when you see that, I, I, it scared me, I think. It made me realize this could, be, this could be me. This could happen to me, you know? And I didn't want that. I was terrified of that. Um, but anyway, I remember going into the meeting and I had the binder and it was just me sitting in there and I just read. So I don't really want to get into this, but because it's like, you know, the traditions, but there's like ways that you start a meeting and you go through and you say things and basically you get to a point at the beginning where you say, you know, um, we, you know, we celebrate days of sobriety. Is anybody celebrating? And then you go through the days, like, you know, 30 days, 60 days on and on and on. And then, and I, and when it, I, so I'm reading this out loud and then it said, you know, it gets to the point where it says, does anybody have multiple years of sobriety? And I said, you know, my name out loud and how many years I had. And then I took a coin and then I started the meeting. I, I look back on this and I just think to myself, like, and I remember going home and like not talking to anybody about it too. Like just being like, not really having anybody to talk to about it, you know? So then I said, like, does anybody have any issues? You know, <laughs> nobody said anything because it was just me. And um, I closed the meeting. And I remember I walked out and I told the secretary at the front desk, I handed her the binder and I said, I didn't start this meeting. And I said, I don't know how to close the meeting. And I said, but I'm not gonna be back. And I said, so if you guys wanna continue the meeting, you need to have somebody else um, start this meeting. Because there was nobody there. Nobody was coming. They weren't even bringing the people from the hospital anymore, you know? I think in retrospect, I would go back and I would continue to go for a while, you know? Or I would try to bring some friends and us, like, have a meeting and start it up again. I would do that differently. But I didn't know at the time, you know? I was... The only people that I knew were in sobriety. And I was just at that point start like most of the people that I knew that were in sobriety were people that I worked with you know so I was just like starting to meet some people because there were I shared this on here there was a long period of time where I didn't feel like I fit in in early sobriety you know I was young and I didn't know a lot of people so the people that I was meeting we worked I worked in treatment with and we all like went to different programs I mean there was you know there was like three, well now, a couple different more on top of that, because there's Heroin Anonymous and stuff, but like there were at the time, like three, you know, major programs, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, and Cocaine Anonymous, and all three, all of us that worked together, we all went to all different programs. Like, um, you know, Judy Smith over here, she might go to, you know, Narcotics Anonymous, and so-and-so might go over here to, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, and somebody might go to Cocaine Anonymous, and so it's like we were all going to different programs, and so we weren't really interacting with each other going to the same meetings, right, you know, and, but we were friends talking about sobriety. It was just a real lonely time for me after that, and then I didn't have a sponsor until I started going 
to meetings with Tanya, to her home group, and I got my sponsor that I had for a really long time. And let me just tell you, one of the most dangerous things that you can do in sobriety is not have a sponsor. <laughs> um, I don't really know how I did it, in all honesty, but I went up, like at least like a year without a sponsor. I think. Maybe I have like a sponsor by name or something, but I don't think so. I'm, maybe I did. I don't know. I know I'm supposed to remember everything specifically, but it has been 22 years since that happened. 24 and a half years since I've been sober. I can't believe I've been sober 24 and a half. I mean, if you had told me at any time in my early sobriety, you'll be sober 20 plus years, I would have been like, get the hell out of here. No, I won't. I would never have believed it in a million years. Anyway, I remember getting a call that my sponsor had passed. And like I said, he wasn't my sponsor at the time. Because I, I do remember talking to my new sponsor um, about him passing. But I found out, like, like, it was like two or three weeks after he had passed. I think. Maybe longer than that. But those early days, I can remember, you know, well, first of all, the early, early days of sobriety, I mean, I got out at the beginning of January. So that winter was one of the harshest winters that Indiana ever had. And it was cold outside and it was snowy. And, <laughs> you know, if I wanted anything from my apartment complex, from, my, from where I lived, I had to walk to the grocery store. Or I had to walk to, you know, the gas station if I, you know, whatever. My dad would pick me up once a week. I didn't really have a whole lot of interaction with me. He wasn't super, super friendly, I would say, for the first six months. Supportive, very supportive. Emotionally detached, definitely. Um, you know, he would come and pick me up and be like, we had a special time that, you know, he would come date and time. I don't remember when it was, but I do remember that he would pick me up like a Saturday or something. And he'd be like, come on, Pete, let's go. And, he, and he'd say, okay, tell me what's going on with your week, how your week has been. And it was very much like I was 10 years old again. And he would ask me about, you know, my counseling and, and you know, and he was talking to my counselor and he was talking to those people, I, you know, making sure that I was going and whatever. But really, that was it. He didn't really want to know anything other than the fact that I was showing up. Because if I didn't show up, he wanted me out. He was like, I'm done. If you don't show up to these, all you have to do is show up and not use. If you can't do that, I'm done with you. He was so pissed. And I'm getting texts like crazy. I don't know why. So anyway, um, he would pick me up and then he would buy me a carton of cigarettes. At the time, I smoked Camel Light Wides. Do you guys remember those? Do they even still make those? I don't know. But anyway, that's what I smoked. And then we would go to the grocery store. And he basically would let me get whatever I wanted. But, um... You know, he, my dad is very healthy and he would focus on like, we would go to the deli and he would buy me really nice, like turkey breast and ham breast or, you know, and ham breast, turkey breast and ham and then really nice cheese. But like today, what would be like that boar house or whatever that's called, you know? And then huge containers of what was called creamy rotini. It was this pasta that my dad and I loved and, you know, juices, all different kinds of juices that I had and soda. And I'm gonna read this text in just a second, but and soda and you know coffee and you know they're just it was and, and cookies. He would let me get like cookies and stuff like that, you know. And I don't know, it was just. And my stepmom would bring me like you know a candle for my house, and I started taking pride in cleaning my own space. And I talked about this the other day with like making my bed and stuff, you know. But I took pride, you know, like the, those that first year and like cleaning my own space and vacuuming and making my bed every day and becoming a person of character and having food in, food in my fridge. Oh my god, this is what I was gonna say. Like boxes and boxes and boxes upon boxes of macaroni and cheese, and I would make macaroni and cheese like literally every day with a peanut butter sandwich. That was like an orange juice or a glass of milk. That was what I ate every single day. Um, 
just so you know, if you get sober, <laughs> there's no time limit on when people can contact you, <laughs> okay? So, but it was just somebody let me know that they were home. But, um, what is this star sushi? I've never heard of that before. It was good, you know? And I think that's why today, like, making a cup of coffee in the Keurig or having candle waxes, like, it reminds me of those early days a little bit, you know? There's something to be said for all of that. I think it, what happened, really, was at some point, I just gave in you know, I think as addicts and alcoholics, we just resist so much in life, you know? If the lesson is here, we're just like, mm -mm, we refuse, we refuse, we refuse. We're going to do it our way. We're going to control. We're, it's all about control. We're going to control it. We're going to, you know, whatever. Any time in life that the lesson is right in front of me and I'm like, no, 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 no. And then finally I'm like, okay, maybe, okay, yeah, I guess. My life goes a lot easier for me, right? And I think what happened was I just stopped fighting, you know? And, and, and that's a good reminder for me for anything in life is that, when I stop fighting and I let go and I let God, as the saying is, you know, and I just kind of surrender to, it's like my life goes a lot easier. I learn the lesson. I learn what I need to change about myself, what I need to work on myself. And I think that's what happened in early sobriety. I just was like, I don't want to die. Like, I don't want to die. When I was really, really, truly honest with myself, you know, because I think there was a point in my sobriety where I was like, I want to die. I don't care if I live or die. You know, I remember... My counselor, this is something she said to me, another thing that she said that was really powerful. She said to me, so you're suicidal. Oh, I was, she was talking about my drinking levels because I was, you know, I mean, I drank a fifth and a half of Jack Daniels a day. I drank like three forties. I drank like a half a case of beer. I mean, I drank to oblivion for my size and for my age. On top of eating pills, I was, Vicodin was my drug of choice, smoking crack cocaine, using cocaine, smoking weed all day long. I mean, I was just a, a total junkie, right? And she was like, so you were suicidal. And I was like real offended by that. And I was like, I'm not suicidal. I've never been suicidal in my life. And she was like, but you're trying to kill yourself. And I'm not trying to kill myself. She goes, yeah, you're slowly trying to kill yourself. What, what else would you call it? And I remember like being pissed when she said it. And then like I looked back later and I thought, she's right. And she also said, well, if you're not trying to kill yourself, you're trying to kill off part of yourself. Something about yourself that you don't like. I don't know. I really think in retrospect, me being gay has so much more to do with it. I mean, I really dr truly believe in the predisposition for addiction. And so I think it's like if I have the window open and the air going, it's perfect. But if I have just the air, it's too cold and the window open, it's too hot. So <laughs> with the air off and the window open, it's too hot. But, um, you know, one of the things that everybody would say to me is like at the time that I got sober, it's like, we need to do inventory on you being gay. It has nothing to do with that. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm totally cool with being gay. I'm out. I'm totally comfortable in my own skin. I don't think that was true at all. I think it was total bullshit. I think that, you know, the abuse that I had suffered for so long over people speculating if I was gay or calling me gay or whatever, I think had really done some serious damage to of self-hatred. I, I think I really, as a gay man, had some true self-hatred as a gay person. I really, really do. Um, and I don't even really know how I came full circle to that. But, you know, when we want to talk about pride today, and I think this is an important discussion, and, you know, we, there's a lot of gay people that are sober that have gone through similar things as me. I mean, my story is not that unique. My story is not that unique at all um, to a lot of people, you know? Which is why I share it, because I hope that other people can relate to it in some way. But when you go through such hell of people, you know, condemning you for who you are inside, and you come out on the other side of it, and you look at yourself in the mirror, and you say, I am proud of who I am today, right? That is where pride comes from. And I don't think people understand that. I think people are like, well, why are you pr proud of being gay or bisexual, you know, or any part of the LGBTQIA plus community? Well because we went through adversity to not hate ourselves. And, you know, the opposite of hate is love. You know, the opposite of shame is pride. So that is what pride is about. It's about the opposite of shame. 
of not being ashamed of who I am, not hating myself for who I am. And I really think that in retrospect, I really, really did hate myself for quite some time, you know? I think I just was like, I don't know, I just really don't think I, 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 I think if I had been really, really honest with myself at that time, I hated myself. Um, and I hated that part of myself and I hated that people could pick that part of, apart and I, I hated that that was what made me different and that that was what people saw in me and I hated all of that about myself and I think when I drank and I drugged I didn't think about it and I don't think that's the only thing I mean I think there's a lot of things that happened in my life that you know were there and I think I also just loved to drink I mean and I loved to you know use drugs I had fun it was fun for me I loved it like it just didn't work for me you know, when other people drank, they didn't drink all day long and to the point where they were passed out, you know, in somebody's front yard and they don't even remember how they got there. Like, that's how I drank. But somebody else doesn't drink that way, you know? It was like I made this video today and I made this comment about smoking weed and I got a couple comments on there. I was watching a video and first of all, when you've been sober as long as I have, you can spot somebody high or drunk a mile away, even if they've only had a glass and a half of wine, okay? It's just true. And if you're sober, sound off in the comment section below, because you know what I'm talking about. Somebody can look right at you and go, I've only had one beer, and you can you could tell, you could could tell probably tell them more accurately how much they've drank than you can. And you can tell when somebody is affected by a drug or whatever. You just can, because you, can, you watch people on a regular basis, you know what I mean, in your personal life or on YouTube. So when you see somebody that's acting a little different, you're like, Oh, well, they're that. Well, so I was, comment I was commenting about Jeffrey Star. Jeffrey Star doesn't drink. So it's obviously from him smoking pot, right? And he was acting different at the beginning of the video. And all these people were like, you know, um, why do you care? Why do you care? Why is it? Because I said, I don't personally love watching somebody that's high. Just sit I, I don't. Like, I'm sorry. That's my prerogative. I don't love sitting around somebody that's drunk. It's not about the drug or the drink. I don't love to sit there and watch somebody slur their words on, you know, a pain medication. It makes me sad. I don't understand. It's, that doesn't look fun to me. You know what I mean? So that's my prerogative. I don't like to watch that. <clears throat> and I got a couple comments about it and people were like, well, it's legal now. It's legal. It's now. Whatever. And I think that's the thing that, like, like, that doesn't take away from me on the fact that I can't smoke pot. Like, when I smoked pot, I didn't smoke pot like maybe these people do, you know, where they can smoke a little bit and have some fun and whatever. Like, I smoked all day, every day, right? I don't know. I just don't enjoy watching that. Like, it, I don't... And when, and even when I watch, like, recovery movies... Like, people always ask... Okay, this is a good one. Because people ask me a lot on here. Do you watch, um... What do you call it? Intervention. No, I don't watch Intervention anymore. It devastates me. It makes me too sad. And I think the whole show is fake. And I'll tell you why the show is fake. is because that show's been on the air for about 10 years now. And how these people still know, after 10 years, that somebody following them around with a camera in from a TV show that they're going to offer them treatment at the end is whatever. I think they ought to just get on the TV show, do an intervention in the first five minutes, and offer them treatment, and show where it's at ten, a year later. That's what I think. I don't think we need to follow these people around and be part of that sickness. It makes me sad. It, it really breaks my heart. Um, there was one that I watched that was the breaking point for me. I've had several friends of mine in my life, and this is when I stopped watching it, and I don't know when this was, but somebody out there that's watching this has probably seen this episode if you've seen every episode of Intervention. And this wasn't even about drugs, but there was this one episode and the girl was bulimic and her husband would leave for work in the morning and she and I don't remember if she got help or not but I just remember watching it and I thought to myself I thought to myself ah, I feel like this show is like part of the problem a little bit. Even if they're offering people a treatment at the end, and the reality is when you do the follow-ups on intervention, because I would, I would follow up, and there was, a, I would like watch the follow-up shows and stuff like that, and there was like, they would tell you at the end, you know what happened, and then you could like find out later on the website. Do you guys know about that? Okay. And was that a different show? No, that was intervention. I was gonna say, is that that, that one recovery house one, or was that, I think that was that. 
they don't, the rates aren't really great with success, but you know, I don't know if you know this, but the, the rates of success with interventions aren't really great anyway. And nine times out of 10 people just bolt. They, they can't handle it and they leave. Interventions are not, I mean, therapeutic interventions, A, should never be done by somebody that is like n not trained in doing that, right? And B, I don't know. It's just, it's it's scary to me. So I was watching this one intervention and I will say like the counselors that they have on there that are, and they are trained interventionists that are on there. Like that one woman, she was really good. And there was another guy that was really good. And, um, but you never know how it's going to go. I mean, when it's a TV episode, we're watching it and thinking we don't know how it's going to go, but they know how it's going to end because they've already put the TV show together, right? So it was this one episode and... It was this woman, God love her, it made me so sad, and it's why I don't watch that show Hoarders, in all honesty, that show Hoarders makes me really sad too, and um, so she would, she had like an infant child, like the child was like one or younger than that or something, it was like young enough that it didn't, it really wouldn't have known what was going on, like to report back to like, you know, its father or whatever. And her husband would leave, and she would get in the car, and she would take her one child to school, and then she would have her other child in the back in the car seat, and she would go through McDonald's, and she would eat, like, all this food at McDonald's, and then she would go home, and she would puke in these Ziploc bags, and she kept them in, um the closet and she would hide them in the closet and then when her husband was gone or asleep or something she would empty them out in the toilet and I remember watching this and I thought and this was like on the heels of me maybe it was the same episode because you know how sometimes they would do like two separate episodes in the same it was this girl and she was chasing dope and her mom was buying her dope and heroin and um there was this scene where she was, like, in a car, and they were, like, and her mom was, like, she was, like, you gotta buy me, I'm, I'm going, I'm getting dope sick, I'm getting dope sick, I'm getting dope sick, and her mom was, like, no, I'm not gonna buy it for you, and then her mom, like, said something to the cameraman and was, like, well, I'll buy it for her, but only if you guys turn off the camera and don't put me on, it's gonna stop, hold on. Okay, but she was like, I'll do it for her, but only if, because I don't want her to get sick because she's gonna die of an overdose, but only if you guys turn the camera off and, um, and you don't, um, what do you call it? And you don't record me doing it. And they turn the camera off and let her do it. And I understand that. You know what I mean? Like, this isn't my first time at the rodeo. You think I've never met family members before that have bought drugs for their family, for their kids, for their spouses, because they're so afraid of them not loving them or ended up dying or going into withdrawals? Do you not think that I don't know family members that have paid drug dealers gone to drug dealers' houses where they're holding a gun to their head and it's somebody's grandfather and they're paying their drug debts for them. You think I haven't heard these stories from the grandfathers and the kids and you know what I mean? Like, you think I don't have friends of mine that have put themselves in that situation? You know, friends of mine that have put their spouses and, you know, like, trust me, I have. You know, I get it, but it breaks my heart. It makes me sad and I don't know. I think there's maybe a different TV show that we could be putting together out there instead of having to show that. So no, I don't watch Intervention anymore. I see the reality of what drugs and alcohol do. I see the stigma that we still carry to this day as being alcoholics and addicts. I see the societal per perception of addiction in our country. And I see the continued lack of, you know, assistance to dealing with that as well as mental health. And I'm, a, you know, if you watch my channel, you know, um, We've got to start getting funding and appropriate treatment for addicts, alcoholics, and people that have mental health issues. I mean, it's really scary to me that there are people out there that are suffering. You know, there are all, like, let's move this aside from addiction for a second and take it away from that. You know, how many friends of mine that have, that are also addicts and alcoholics, but have been misdiagnosed for years and years and years, you know? And then all of a sudden, they go and they see this doctor who's like, you have been misdiagnosed, you know, for 15 years and on the wrong medication for that. And so then as a result, they're trying to self-medicate. And then you got family and friends who are like, if you loved us enough, you would just stop using. But they're self-medicating 
because they don't know how to deal with the, the mental health issue. It just breaks my heart. There are so many people that are suffering out there on a daily basis, you know, and it's like, I literally now get like messages you guys daily from people who are telling me about their family members that are addicts and alcoholics. Literally daily. I probably get 20, you guys. You know, across all of my social media platforms like DMs and then emails and stuff like that. And I don't even really know what to say. I have a friend of mine right now that I know is going to probably die from this disease. And, um... You know, I've done so much, but you oh, you can only do so much, you know? And I think that's why, like, it's really, really important for me to get on here and show you guys that this is what sobriety can look like. You know, and I'm not talking about YouTube, okay? This has nothing to do with YouTube. This is what sobriety can look like, that you too can get through a parent dying and you're gonna be fine. You can get through weddings and you can have an amazing time at weddings and trips and you don't ever have to drink or use. And, you know, you can go get fountain pops with your good Judy and <laughs> have a good, I mean, my God, I can't but tell you how many messages I get from people that are like, I wish I was your good Judy, I wish I was your good Judy. I mean, like, that's so silly, right? That like, I don't know, something so small. You can have that too. You can have a friend that you drive around in a car with and get a fountain pop with, right? If you struggle with all of these issues. I just want people to know there is life out there after the drink and after the drug, but you gotta put it down, you know? You have to. Because it's not gonna get any better. I feel blessed tonight, you know, that I get a, have I been vlogging for like an hour? Um, that went rather quick. You know, I feel blessed. Every day I feel blessed, but tonight I feel especially blessed, you know, when I think about, okay, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna eat my popcorn opulus because I already blew my diet. Popcorn opulus while I watch Orange is the New Black, you know, and, um, that's how I'm gonna settle my day, in my day, and then you know get into my bed with my fan, and which is my priority, and you know my fan, my man, and my dogs, <laughs> and that's how it is, you know, and and start the day over tomorrow, and the fact that we have you know candle waxes that have smelled up our whole house, and our house smells like fall, and I have mums, and um, do you guys want to see my mums? Oh my god. Okay, well, I'll pull in here somewhere and I'll show you. But um, that I have mums and a pumpkin on my front porch. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's silly stuff like that. But it makes me really, really happy. I don't really want to pull into this strip mall because I don't really know what that strip mall is. <laughs> so I'm not going to pull into that strip mall. I'll show you my... I might have to buy some more mums. But you know, I like, Alex and I were talking about that tonight. You know, just this life that we had that we just never knew. How grateful we would be, we would have to have such a simple life, you know, and be so blessed for, you know, I said to him, I made some comment about I said, we were, I was talking about the dogs, and I said, you know, they don't run away. <laughs> I said, past the barking, because that really is it, past the barking, like, they're really good dogs. And I said to Alex, I said, we have three of, like, the best. I mean, we really do. They're so sweet. You know, they're just so, so, so sweet. They're so well-mannered. They're so good. And I said, besides the barking... Like, they're great dogs. And he said, you know, we do. We have really sweet dogs. We're really lucky, you know, to have that. And, you know, we have a home that 
we don't worry about where we're sleeping tonight and we're able to go out to dinner or buy snacks or have food in the refrigerator, you know? We're able to take trips. We're able to buy clothes and have clothes to wear, you know? And those things are all kind of luxury things to some degree when you think about traveling and food, you know? Or traveling and clothes, like, you know, shoes and whatever, but like food, that we can buy food and have that or, you know, whatever, that I can buy mums. I mean, like, that's a luxury thing as well. I was going to pull in here, but I didn't. It was just all those little things, and I don't know. I know I talk about it a lot on here, but I think it's because I want to remind myself regularly how blessed I am to have that life um, and how blessed I feel that I can put some candle waxes in my candle or a candle warmer on and it makes me so happy like I want to I want to remember that like I don't want to forget that I don't want to get you know into this world where I think things that don't matter matter I've been there before I've been there when I thought a bag or a piece of jewelry or something would make me 100% happier do I do I like nice things absolutely don't get me wrong I love nice things you know but they don't make me happy for very long. And as long as I can be honest with myself about that, and you know, not that those are things that I have to have, then that's okay for me to have those things. But what really makes me happy at the end of the day are the smallest things, you know? You guys are gonna die when you see these, uh, these moms, they are beautiful, if I do say so myself. <laughs> okay, there's Alex's pizza, okay. Come on. How did I do this before? Do you guys remember? I did this, I think. Look at those mums and my pumpkin. Aren't they so pretty? So anyway... All right, you guys, listen, I'm gonna get off here now. This pretty hairdo today, oh my lord. And I am gonna go home. I'm like worried that my hair is starting to get thin, but I looked at it and Alex is like, do you want me to get you some Nioxin? Which is like this, uh, it's supposed to thicken your hair or something. But then I like looked through it and I was like, it's not getting thinner. My dad has really thick hair. Both sides of my family had really, really thick hair. So I don't think I have to worry about that. Um, my hairstylist, she always says I'm not losing hair. I mean, I lost hair and had a receding hairline. Like this receding hairline, I've literally had since I was like 25 or 26. So I don't think I am gonna, I think this is it. <laughs> this is how I'm gonna look forever. But I got a little worried about it today. But anyway, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna watch Orange is the New Black and finish it and ball my eyes out. And um, anyway, I hope you guys are having a fantastic Tuesday. Unless you have other plans, but don't have other, like I always, okay, let's start this over. <laughs> Gotta get this right. Okay. Here's the situation. I hope you guys are having a fantastic Tuesday, unless you have other plans, but like I always say, don't have other plans. Make the most of your day. Do something fun, do something exciting. Um, you know, reach out to a friend you haven't talked to in a while. I don't know. You know, start a new book. Start my friend Anna. <laughs> That's a book for the book club this month. And um, I did a book club video, or book uh, tube video today, talking about the book club book for next month that Mel picks. So you can go and find out what that book was. It's a really exciting one. I read the synopsis on the video. So anyway, yeah, have an amazing day. Have an amazing Tuesday, unless you have other plans, like I always say. Um, but don't have other plans. Wait, how do I, I get it. I'm losing my mind. I'm over here walk, looking at this store called Simply Chic, and it has all fun f uh, fashions. Oh, by the way, hi, Karen. Karen always comments. She lives like I, around here somewhere, I think. And she always says, I'm waving. <laughs> she always says that. So hi, Karen. It just reminded me of that being over here. But anyway. Okay, have an amazing Tuesday. Um, do something fun, do something exciting, unless you have other plans, like I always say. But don't have... <laughs> I've only said it 900 times now, I should know it, right? Have an amazing Tuesday, unless you have other plans. But like I always say, do not have other plans. Make the most of your day, do something fun, do something exciting. Reach out to a friend you haven't talked to in a while. And if nobody else has told you this today, I love you. Look in the mirror every single day and tell yourself, I love you, validate yourself, 
you are valuable and tell yourself good things about yourself um, and yeah let's work on our let's work on building ourselves up today okay and most importantly letting somebody else know this hat is not wanting to sit on my head correctly somebody should have let me know that but most importantly letting somebody else know how important they are to you and saying to them hey you're really important to me you mean a lot to me you have changed my life I appreciate you being in my life you make me laugh or you make me think about things or I just love you as a friend or I love you as a sibling or I love you as you know whatever a cousin and thank you for being in my life and um, or even a co-worker you know bring your co-worker or your supervisor a candy bar or a cup of coffee <laughs> you know if you do it for your supervisor people are probably thinking that you're trying to you know brown nose a little bit but that's okay that's okay <laughs> anyway I hope you guys are having a great day I love you and I will see you tomorrow oh wait, how do I how do I end it now I can't remember how I end it I love you guys and I will see you tomorrow bye Love ya. <laughs> love ya. Love ya. Love ya. Love ya. Love ya, love ya.